OK, yeah, let's go through it. So my name is Esteban Bernetxea. I'm a principal consultant for, for ORS. We are a process functional safety consultancy, also dealing with the risk analysis for the process industries. Um, our main goal is to help our clients achieve uh, um, safety overall and specifically also process and functional safety in their processes, in their applications, right? So today we will be talking about safety integrity level. What is it? When to use it? When to apply it? Let's get to it. Um, so, I remember starting my functional safety journey uh, years ago and thinking, yeah, functional safety is sometimes incredibly confusing, right? There are so many there are so many concepts, so many ideas related to SEAL and to functional safety, right? You have this jumble of, of concepts, this myriad of ideas, right? Safety, functional safety, process safety, architectural constraints, probability of failure on demand, uh, MTTR, random hardware failure, systematic failures, dangerous failures, right? You have a world of concepts and ideas to explore when you start working with functional safety and with SEAL, right? By the end of this webinar, I hope you will be able to understand the framework of SEAL, what it means, many of the concepts that are related to it, and when it is good to apply them, right? When you need to apply them, where it's a good idea for you to start using functional safety, right? And by um, extension SEAL. So let's start at the beginning, and then we'll loop back. So. What is SEAL? SEAL means the acronym Safety Integrity Level, right? Now, SEAL is defined in um, an international standard by the International Electrotechnical Commission, 61508. We'll talk a lot about this standard. So, SEAL is a discrete level, of which there are four, depending on the industry you work in. Um, for the process industries, for example, we only have three, but as per IC61508, there are four levels of SEAL, and it corresponds to safety integrity values, right? Where level four is highest, level one is the lowest. Doesn't mean that four is better than one, it's just different safety integrity, right? So, this definition, which is what the standard gives you, may not seem incredibly clear if it's the first time you're hearing about SEAL, right? but it does give you some clues to what it is. So SEAL is a number. Maybe not what you were expecting to hear, this great insight into what SEAL is. So yeah, it's a number. <laughs> so it's a number that, uh, that is assigned to specify safety integrity, right? Again, one to four, and it specifies safety integrity. We, we will start peeling the layers of this concept. Now, what SEAL is not, is a discipline, it's not a field of engineering, right? SEAL is very much a number, a discrete level from one to four assigned to safety functions to specify their safety integrity. SEAL exists within a framework called functional safety, right? And is defined primarily in the IC61508 standard. Now, IEC 61508 is called Functional Safety of Electrical, Electronic, Programmable, Electronic Safety Related Systems. We will talk a lot about those in the next half hour or so. It's Electric, Electrical, Electronic, Programmable, Electronic, EEPE. That's going to be, I'm going to be saying that so much in the next 20 minutes or so. So IEC 61508 is the master standard for functional safety. Whenever you have a question about functional safety, you go to the standard or to someone who knows a lot about this standard. Below IEC 61508 exists a lot of application specific standards, right? So if you work in the process industry, you have heard of IEC 61511, which is the application of 61508 to the process industry. But there are other applications. There's a standard for machinery. There's a standard for nuclear, for nuclear plants for nuclear facilities, for power drives, for railway applications, for the automotive industry, right? And 
they all define how functional safety is applied to their specific industries and therefore how SEAL is defined for each of them. However, the root standard is 61508 and that's where the master definitions are which apply to all other industries as well. Now, that's that's where functional safety derives from, right? That's the first publication, the, the big father standard of all the publications. Now, what is functional safety then? And I know the webinar is about what SEAL is, and I cannot tell you what SEAL is without explaining what functional safety is. But I cannot explain what functional safety is without explaining what safety is first. So what is safety, right? Safety is freedom from unacceptable risk. That is overall safety. Whenever you're in an activity, you're yeah, part of an activity that may have hazardous consequences, right? Which is basically everything humans do. Driving a car, getting on a plane, um, going out on your bike, or operating a crude oil refinery where flammable and toxic things may get out of the pipes. All of those activities have a risk related to them, right? And there is a level at which that risk becomes unacceptable, right? Now, safety is freedom from that unacceptable level of risk. Within the overall safety, right, leaves process safety, occupational health and safety, and a tiny bit of this overall safety is called functional safety. Now, this is the part of the overall safety that relates to the equipment under control. I'll explain what that is in a moment, but it's an important concept for SEAL and functional safety. Um, it's the part of overall safety related to the process, the equipment under control, depending on the correct functioning of electrical, electronic, programmable, electronic safety related systems and other risk reduction measures. What do you need to take from that is basically equipment under control and e EPE safety related systems. That's what functional safety is about. Now, all of this will make sense in regards to SEAL in not a long time. So what is the equipment under control then? The equipment under control is whatever equipment, plant, machinery that you're using to manufacture a product or, or to do your process and or other activities, right? It could be a car. A car could be the equipment under control. So an offshore gas production platform is an equipment under control. A wind turbine, a wood chipper, a chemical plant. An equipment inside that um, inside that plant, inside that process, could be your equipment under control, right? So you just need to note that. EUC, Equipment Under Control, is IC61508 terminology, not necessarily IC61511 or any of the other standards. But that should give you an idea. Whatever it is that you're using to manufacture, to process, that is the equipment under control. E EPE, Safety Related Systems, are functions, safety functions, which achieve or maintain a safe state of the EUC and which are based on one or more EEP devices. Now, you may have several of these functions. When they are implemented by one system, that's called the Safety Instrumented System, or SIS. Each of the functions within that Safety Instrumented System is called a Safety Function or a Safety Instrumented Function. That is a function that, impl that is implemented by an EEPE SIS and that is intended to achieve or maintain a safe state for the equipment under control in respect to a specific hazardous event, right? A lot of concepts in very short time, I know. So let's put an example out there, right? Imagine, and this is very process oriented, but uh, I'll give you one more example after this. So imagine you have a chemical reactor, right? And through that chemical reactor goes a steam coil that is used to heat the contents. Now, if the temperature gets too high within that reactor, you could, for example, suffer a sudden vaporization of the contents and overpressure the reactor. If the reactor overpressures, then you have a loss of containment of highly toxic substances 
which could then cause a toxic dispersion, multiple fatalities, a disaster on your hands, right? Imagine that situation could occur, which for people in the process industries, is it's not crazy to think about. These things can happen. Now, how do we avoid them from happening? That's what functional safety is about. Now, in that case that I just explained, in that hypothetical reactor, the reactor itself is the equipment under control. That's what we want to keep under control to ensure that the people working around it are safe, right? And the environment and all the assets are safe. Our equipment under control, the EUC, the control system for that EUC, or as we refer to it in the process industries, the basic process control system, the BPCS, is the temperature control loop, right? So that temperature transmitter that goes to a logic solver and is modulating a control valve to allow more or less flow of steam, that is the basic process control system. If that were to fail and that valve goes more open than it should, then the temperature will start rising in the equipment under control in the reactor. And for that, there is a safety related function or safety instrumented function, which is a temperature switch that sends, interprets the temperature in the reactor and says, this is getting out of kilter, this is getting too high, sends a signal to a logic solver and closes the shut off valve to stop the flow of steam and bring the equipment under control to a safe state, right? So that's our equipment under control, our control system and our safety instrumented function. Now, what is SEAL? SEAL is basically how good that safety instrumented function needs to be so that you can ensure functional safety and you can ensure overall safety, right? When you combine that, that safety instrumented function with other protection layers in your system, that achieves overall safety. And functional safety is for that function to achieve the required seal, not only during um, the design stage, but also during the operation and maintenance. So the CIS, the CIF may be part of an overall system, of a bigger system that implements several functions, and that's the safety instrumented system. Within that safety instrumented system, there may be several safety instrumented functions, each one with a seal. The question that we will try to answer always during design is whether each of those functions should be SEAL 1, SEAL 2, SEAL 3, or if we need something else, right? So that's what SEAL is. How good does that temperature function, that high, high temperature trip needs to be, right? Now, what other functions are there? Examples of other equipment under control and other functions. Easy, right? A car, you're driving a car, that's the equipment under control. To ensure that the driver is safe, that you're safe, and the people within the car are safe, and the people outside the car are safe, you have a safety instrumented function, right? The car brakes. So that has components that are electrical, electronic, program electronic, or it may have them, that ensure that your equipment under control is kept in a safe state, right? So that's an example out of the process industry. And SEAL would be how good do my brakes need to be, right? If and, and that will depend on the consequences of them failing. But that's basically what SEAL means. You will notice that I haven't said SEAL is a number. Sorry, it is a number. I haven't said SEAL is a probability of failure on demand right, which is what a lot of people associate to SEAL. Now, I haven't said that because SEAL is not only a probability of failure on demand, SEAL is many other things. We'll talk about it in a second. So, just to drive this idea home, you have a safety instrumented system. That's what's in the dotted line inside that box, right? And within that safety instrumented system live a lot of safety instrumented functions or may live a lot of safety instrumented functions which do different things for different hazardous scenarios, right? So each of those safety instrumented functions has a unique seal, right? So seal is not a function of the safety instrumented system, nor of the components. Seal only exists for the functions. So seal is a number that applies to each of these one of each of these functions, right? 
to the high level switch closing those two valves xv1 and xv2 or to the pressure switch opening or closing that valve that is what seal is how good the integrity of those functions needs to be a safety instrumented function is normally traditionally not always but traditionally composed of several elements which can be divided into three blocks mainly input devices those are sensors that send you know a signal that interpret a signal from the process interpret a variable in the process and send the signal to a logic solver which interprets this information and then tells the final element to do something based on that information that the transmitter is relying right uh, so you have your input devices your logic solvers your final elements all of that together doing a function a specific function that is a safety instrumented function only safety instrumented functions have seal each of the components does not have a seal they are seal capable but you don't have seal three logic solvers you don't have seal two valves they are seal capable components which when combined with other components in a specific configuration achieve a seal okay which is only for the function still being how good does this function need to be so looping back to the original idea right to the original concept of all this what is seal is a discrete level one out of possible four for specifying the safety integrity requirements of safety functions allocated to the electrical electronic programmable electronic safety related systems where safety integrity level four is the highest and safety integrity level one is the lowest right highest and lowest not worse not better or worse highest and lowest so sometimes you the consequences the hazards associated to your equipment under control are so high that you may need a seal three if you don't need a seal three you shouldn't build or design or maintain a seal three okay because more seal does not mean better seal it doesn't mean you know it doesn't mean that your system is safer by design or anything it needs to be done optimally so it's higher or lowest not better or worse keep that keep that in mind always more seal higher seal is not necessarily better um so the risk reduction is better has other implications that we'll talk about in the future so the higher the seal the more difficult it is to achieve the seal the more difficult it is to maintain that seal the more difficult it is to keep that function operating at that high required level during all its life now as i said before just a second ago um seal is not a probability of failure on demand probability of failure on demand is part of seal but it's not that to achieve seal you need three things basically hardware reliability or you need to achieve three things hardware reliability that is your probability of failure on demand architectural constraints which is how many redundancies do i have in in, in my safety instrumented function in each of the elements and systematic capability which is am i controlling all the potential systematic failures which could occur within the safety instrumented function now how do you achieve seal right you have for example you need you have identified that your safety instrumented function needs to be seal one or seal two how do you achieve that well as i said there's three things that you need to do two of them are related to hardware and then the other one is related to systematic safety integrity when you look at the hardware of the safety instrumented function, you need to make sure that the probability of failure on demand or the probability of failure per hour, depending on the demand mode, on the operating mode of your function, are achieving the requirements, right? And that's where the, the probabilities come into play. That's when the reliability of the function comes into play. Does it fail one in a hundred demands or one in a thousand or one in 10,000, right? The other thing you need to do is achieve the architectural constraint requirements for the specified seal. For, so for, for a seal three, you need more redundancies or 
better components than for a seal two. By better, I mean more reliable, right? That they have less dangerous failures per hour, for example. So you need to achieve different things. One is probability of failure on demand or probability of failure per hour of the whole function. Remember, this is always for the whole function because only functions have seal. And you also have to achieve architectural constraints, which are defined in the in the functional safety standards. And on the other side, you have to achieve systematic safety integrity requirements, right? So that means limiting the number of systematic failures that occur in your safety instrumented function. So for example, you could you could be introducing uh, a systematic error where whoever is doing the maintenance of a safety of the safety instrumented functions in your plant is calibrating a lot of transmitters wrong and then all of the transmitters would fail would have a common failure mode that is not random so that's what systematic failures are or there could be a systematic error in the coding of a software line somewhere in a plc and every plc that has been sold with that error would have that fault so that's a systematic error and there are measures to control those systematic errors, right? And they are procedural mostly. It's it's part of management systems. So when you design a safety instrumented function, you have to be careful that you are um, removing. Well, when you are designing it or operating or maintaining it, you need to be sure that you're removing as many systematic failures as you can. And there are rules uh, on how to do this as well in the functional safety standards. So that's a short overview of what SEAL is and how to achieve it. So again, I want to drive home the point that, yeah, SEAL is a number from one to four that tells you how good your safety instrumented function needs to be, not your components, your safety instrumented function. Um, to achieve SEAL, you need to make sure that your function's probability of failure on demand or per hour is what it needs to be that its architectural constraints are achieved, mainly meaning that it, you need the redundancies in the components that are required for that level of integrity, and that the systematic failures within that function life cycle have been addressed correctly per the level of the function. The higher the seal, the more difficult it is to achieve all these things, uh, not only in the design, but also during the operation maintenance stages of, of the life of this, this function. So higher seal does not necessarily mean better because it's going to take so many resources to manage a higher seal function. So if you don't need it, you're you're wasting resources that could be better spent somewhere else. So it needs to be optimally decided which functions need seal and which functions need a high seal. Now, when should you apply it? When should you apply functional safety, when should you worry about do, I, do, do my safety functions need seal? Now, before we answer that, we should say that functional safety is not a regulatory requirement in most of the world. It's not in the laws, right? It's, there's no law saying you need to do functional safety. Um, however, it is recognized as the, as the best practice when designing, operating and maintaining electrical, electronic, programmable electronic safety systems in most of the world, I would say, in all of the process industries for sure, in automotive, in rails, in railways, it's it's considered the best practice in most of industry. So, for example, in oil and gas, it's very common to follow IEC 61511 to assure that EEP safety systems are designed, operated and maintained correctly and that sufficient risk reduction is achieved to prevent major accident scenarios, right? Now, that being said, just the caveat that it's it's not a regulatory requirement, but it is a best practice recognized by all of industry. When should you do it? So if you're an operator, an owner of a site, a process or equipment in which electrical, electronic and programmable electronic devices are being used in safety functions to prevent major accident hazards, then you should be thinking of applying functional safety and looking into whether your safety functions need seal. Now, major accident hazards means anything from, you know, someone getting life-altering injuries to people dying, 
to a major accident to the environment, right? So it also depends on the scale of your of your operation. Right? If it's a machine, yeah, someone dying, it's, it's not acceptable for sure. So to escape that unacceptable risk, you need to put in there interlock strips, safety functions, which may need seal to ensure that accidents do not happen in an unacceptable time frame. If you're a manufacturer or integrator of skids or packages which may handle hazardous materials with the potential to cause major accident hazards and you use EEP devices as safety functions, you should be doing functional safety. You should be pursuing functional safety. Why? Like if you're manufacturing this, it's if you're just building a skid, right? And you do have a high pressure trip, an interlock, something, you should be saying, well, let's make sure that what I'm putting in here will meet the requirements of my clients. And there may be, a, you know, seal one, seal two requirement. So let's start from the design process so you know which components to uh, purchase to build your skid, to build your um, package or to be, yeah, to build your, your machine, your unit. Um, if you're a manufacturer of devices, if you're building sensors, logic solvers, valves, relays, which may be used in safety applications, it will be very beneficial for you to follow functional safety because then you can say, well, my sensor achieves all the requirements of uh, SEAL-3, so it's SEAL-3 capable. If I put it together with a logic solver and a final element that achieves the requirements of uh, SEAL-3 um, functions, then the whole function will in all likelihood achieve SEAL-3. That needs to be proven. But, um, but yeah, you can say your component is SEAL-3 capable because you have designed it to a SEAL-3 standard, right? Even though it doesn't have a SEAL-3, there is no SEAL-3 valves it's seal 3 capable okay so correctly applying functional safety will help you ensure you are following the best practices in your industry you are achieving the necessary risk reduction levels to ensure that risk associated to your equipment under control is acceptable so a little recap before we go into questions about functional safety and safety integrity level seal is not a field of engineering. SEAL is a number. It's a measure of how good an electric, electronic, program, electronic safety function needs to be to ensure that safety is achieved when combined with other risk reduction measures. Normally not on its own. When combined with all your other strategies for reducing risk, which may include alarms, it may include mechanical devices which are not EEPE. So when combined with that, you need to make sure that your safety functions are good enough to achieve safety. Now, which is freedom from unacceptable risk. Now, how good the safety function needs to be to achieve that safety? That's what SEAL is. SEAL is the answer to that question. The discipline which deals with the life cycle of these safety functions, electric, electronic, program, electronic safety functions, and from which the concept of SEAL is generated is called functional safety. The place where functional safety is, well, the place, the document where functional safety is defined is the IEC 61508 the standard and its industry specific application standards. But when in doubt, go to IEC 61508 because that's, that's the big one. That's where everything is defined. However, it is a long document with a lot of parts, so, if you go into that, you have a, you know, you'll have a good long read, but that's where functional safety is defined. That's where the concept of SEAL comes from. Functional safety and SEAL are not equivalent things. Functional safety is a framework. It's a discipline. It's, yeah, a framework in which you define what the life cycle of your function, of your safety functions, EEP safety functions is. SEAL is just how good each of these functions need to be. Functional safety is how you manage them, how you achieve, how you ensure, how you make sure that your people is competent enough to be working with these functions to ensure that SEAL is achieved in real life. So functional safety is the house where SEAL lives, okay? 
single devices do not have seal. There are no seal three valves, seal two pressure transmitters in the market. If someone sells you that, that's a misnomer. What they mean is the components are still capable, which means that if you put them in certain specific configurations, which with other components, which also achieve those requirements, then you have a function which has, which achieves a seal, right? So seal is only a property of a safety function, not of each of its components. More seal, higher seal does not mean anything better for you. It, it may mean better risk reduction, but you really need to identify where you need seal. So if you want, like, I want to buy all the components in my plant, I want them to be seal two capable. Well, maybe, I mean, if you, if you have resources to throw about, fair enough, but it may not be an optimal solution for you. The best idea is to find right to find where you need seal and then put your resources there because if you try to make all of your safety functions seal two or seal seal three it would be crazy but let's say seal one or seal two you're gonna have to spend so many resources on not only on buying purchasing the equipment that's not the that's not it the problem is all the management that you're gonna have to do to ensure that these functions are maintained to, an, to a seal two standard that you don't need to do that. You don't need to put your people through that work. Um, seal needs to be done optimally, like everything else in the world. You should do seal optimally. You should use your resources in an optimal manner, right? So if you identify that one function in your plan is extremely important and needs to be seal three, put your resources in that one. Don't put your resources in all the other ones that may not need seal. Because if they don't need seal, it's because the consequences are not that critical for that hazardous scenario. So use your resources where you really need to. So that means choosing seal smartly, right? And um, when to apply functional safety and seal by extension? Whenever you are involved in the life cycle of safety functions which contain electrical, electronic, programmable electronic devices. So that means if you're building the sensors which may be used or the valves or the logic solvers which may be used in safety applications if you're putting them together in a skid that you know may handle hydrogen or may handle something dangerous if you're integrating those parts you should look into functional safety you should be achieving the requirements 56158 or 661511 or any of the other application specific standards if you are operating uh, an equipment under control which may, uh, um, you know, have hazardous consequences to it, associated to it, you should be looking into functional safety. If you are maintaining these functions, you need to be aware of the seal requirements and what that means for the function. So basically, any time that you are involved in the life cycle of safety functions, which have electrical, electronic, programmable electronic devices, you should be looking into functional safety. That's basically everything nowadays um but yeah that's hopefully in 35 minutes or so a good overview of what seal is what it is not um a few of the concepts around it such as equipment under control and safety instrumented system and safety instrumented function and yeah, when to apply these concepts and when you need to start thinking of applying these concepts. So now that I'm hopefully help you get a, a better overview of that, maybe we have some questions in the chat that um, I'll try to go through. So we have a few minutes for questions. And I'll go through some of them. So I'll start publishing the ones that we have. And if anyone has any questions, just put them there. We have around 25. I'll be here for 25 minutes or so answering questions. And yeah, when uh, whenever we don't have, well, whenever we, we, if we don't have time to answer all the questions, then we'll find a way to, to get the answers out there. It may be through a video. It may be through our LinkedIn channel. So let's get through it with the questions. 
Um, so the first one I have here is um, I thought selecting a seal rate is depending on risk reduction and the failure. I guess that's the failure rate. So yeah, selecting a seal will depend on how much risk reduction you need in your specific scenario, right? And that's also related, as I said before, to all the to all the other protection layers that you may have around your safety instrumented function. So in that example where I talked about the reactor, imagine you also have a pressure safety valve, a pressure relief valve. Well, you also need to consider that because that's also providing risk reduction, right? So seal, selecting the seal, deciding how good your function needs to be does depend a lot on what risk reduction you have, you need. And because you need a specific risk reduction, that means that the failure rate of your sieve needs to be lower than that, equal or lower mathematically, but um, hopefully a little bit better, right? So yeah, it, it very much depends on the required risk reduction for the specific scenario. And that will tell you what the failure rate of your sieve is. As I said, then you define, for example, seal two. Well, that will mean that the probability of failure on demand or probability of failure per hour of your safety instrumented function is in a range, right? Depending on exactly how much risk reduction you need. But it will also depend on, you know, it will also give you requirements depending on architectural constraints and systematic errors. Don't focus only on the probability of failure, on the on the failure rate of the function. That's not the only part of SEAL. SEAL is also, and equally importantly, uh, architectural constraints and very much systematic capability, which has been underlooked for some time in, um, in functional safety. And we need to do that work now. So, what other... Um, So another one, let me see if that was published. We can provide something on the seal certificates for instrumentation devices. Yeah, so certificates are always um, a good point of discussion when you're talking about safety, functional safety or seal, right? So what certificates tell you is that the component that you're buying or that you're using in your calculations is capable of achieving a specific seal because it achieves a probability of failure, right? A failure rate. So a certificate will tell you, yeah, this component, we have done a failure mode and effect analysis on it. And the failure rates, you know, the dangerous detected failure rates are these and the dangerous undetected failure rates are that. And that you can equate to a seal capability, not a seal, a seal capability. It will also tell you if the certificate is good. It will also talk about systematic capability. It will tell you that whoever did this assessment for this certificate, he has done a systematic capability assessment. The, 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 the certificate should always tell you whether systematic capability has been considered or not, right? Because if you achieve the random hardware failure rates, that's fair enough, that's very good. But if you don't achieve the systematic capability requirements, then it's going to be very difficult to use this function in a seal application, uh, to use this component in a, in a seal function. So always be careful with, with how you use the certificates, especially uh, if you're doing probability of failure on demand, not probability of failure on demand, sorry. If you're doing seal verification, seal compliance, if you're doing this work and you're telling as a third party, you're telling someone like, oh yeah, you're achieving seal X, you're achieving seal two. Be careful that the components that that organization has selected are actually still capable, including systematic capability. The reliability part, that's not that difficult to control. You can see the numbers and you can see whether it achieves it or not, and you can see a quality of the failure modern effect analysis and but the systematic capability part of it, that's really a lot more qualitative and a lot more complicated to, to go into. So always be aware that that's something that you have to check. 
um, an, an easy one. Um, do we get a copy of the presentation and the record of this webinar? Um, hopefully, my colleague Nazar will uh, probably either post this on our page or put it on LinkedIn, but for sure you're going to get um, at least the presentation. So all those were anonymous. Here I have one from Mashdi. So how do you ensure that the overall safety integrity level of a complex oil and gas project, which comprises multiple safety functions and diverse equipment, meets the required seal target? And what measures are taken to minimize common cause failures among these functions and equipment? Very good. Um, very good question, but really complex. So <laughs> very big. <laughs> so let's get through it. How do you ensure that the overall safety integrity level of a complex oil and gas project comprising multiple functions is met? You don't need to make sure that the overall project meets anything in the realm of functional safety. You need to make sure that each thief meets its safety requirement, its safety integrity level requirement. So, you know, you do, for example, a hazard, you, you follow the IEC 61508 or IEC 61511 the functional safety life cycle. The first stage there, the first phase is going to be hazard and risk assessment. So you do a HACCP as your hazard and risk assessment exercise. You identify all of the scenarios that may require a safety uh, instrumented function with a seal. Um, so that's, you've done that. Now, you do then, uh, you assign safety instrumented functions, safety functions to each of these hazards, and then you allocate through a low power, a risk graph or any uh, a fault tree analysis, whichever technique you want to use, you assign um, a safety integrity level to each of these functions that are protecting against those hazards that you identified in the HACCP, considering each of the initiating events and all your independent protection layers, right? Now, what you need to make sure is that each of the safety instrumented functions that you identified and that are providing uh, a risk reduction that is higher than the seal one, well, higher than equal or higher than seal one, meet their requirements. How you do that for each safety instrumented function which has a seal, you will then generate a safety requirement a specification, right, which tells you how to how to design, how to build, how to maintain those functions, right? It, it gives you the blueprint of what I'm what you're gonna do with each of those SIFs. And then you do your calculations, what we call either seal verification or seal compliance, where you'll make sure that for each SIF, you calculate the probability of failure on demand and that it meets the requirements. You look at the architectural constraints and they meet the requirements and you look at the systematic capability and that they fit the requirements. So that's the design phase. Good, done with the design phase then how do you ensure that you are meeting your functional safety requirements during the life of the plant of the of the project for that this is where it gets more complicated right for this you need what we call a functional safety management system which you would you should have if you're operating a hazardous plant um hazardous plant a plant which handles hazardous materials um so you should have a means of looking at all your safety instrumented functions and seeing whether they are responding in real life as you design them. So you should look into recording data for spurious trips, for real trips, and whether the function did or not what, what they did, or if you've had degradations in the functions, things like this, you should be recording all this data for each of the functions. That's why I say having more seal is not necessarily better because achieving seal in real life has a lot of management associated to it. Um, then, for example, you also need to do your maintenance correctly, right? So you will build, you will develop proof testing procedures for each of these functions, and you need to make sure that this proof testing is performed correctly and as per the um, proof testing period defined in, in your calculations. And you need to make sure that the functions are actually doing what they're doing in their process safety time during this proof testing. And yeah, you know, you, you, it's it's a lot of continuous work to ensure that that you are achieving functional safety uh, and, and that your safety instrumented functions are doing what they should be doing as per design. Hopefully that answers the question. It's a very big question, <laughs> so, so I'm doing my best here. But the, the key element here is to have a functional safety management system where you 
go through each one of the stages of the of the phases of the functional safety life cycle and implement them correctly. And then you can also do well, can you should also do functional safety assessments and functional safety audits to make sure that your functional safety system is running smoothly, that everything is defined there and that you are identifying shortcomings and fixing them as you continue with the operation of the plant. So it's it's a lot of work, but you know, it's it's ongoing and it never stops. Uh, but that's risk management overall, right? It, it never stops. You always have to be on top of these things. Hopefully uh, um, that answer matched this question. Um, thanks for that. That's a really good question. Really interesting. Um, I have Javad asking another interesting question. If we had some SEAL2 capable components, could we achieve SEAL3 by a good manner of application? I am inclined to say no, never, um, because if they are SEAL2 capable, that means that they are not SEAL3 capable, which means that you are not, a, you, the components are not achieving the requirements of SEAL3 for systematic capability. If they are not achieving the requirements for systematic capability, then you shouldn't use them in SEAL3 uh, applications unless you then do the work of proving that they are still three capable. If the probability of failure on demand, if the failure rates of the of each component is too low to achieve seal three capability, then you're not gonna get to seal three because that's it. The probability of failure on demand is gonna end up being the probability of failure on demand of the safety instrumented function is gonna end up being the probability of failure on demand of the sensors plus the probability of failure on demand of the logic solver plus the uh, probability of failure on the man of the logic uh, of the final elements. If any of these three, the block, not each of the components, the blocks, you could have two out of three, and then you know you could have voting in in each of these components, in each of these blocks. If, if any of those blocks is letting you down, where you're not achieving seal three in any of these blocks, the function cannot achieve seal three. So it is very difficult to have um, to achieve seal three. Difficult, I would say impossible to achieve SEAL 3 if you don't have SEAL 3 capable components. Sometimes it's difficult to achieve to achieve SEAL 3 which, with SEAL 3 capable components. So because then when you put them all together, it doesn't add up. And then the systematic capability part of it is it's very important. If if the certificates don't say that and, and you have good certificates that talk about systematic capability and no one has done the systematic capability assessment for them. Achieving SEAL 3 in real life is going to be it's going to be very difficult. Um, so so yeah, I hope that helps. What you can do always. Um, first thing, if you have a SEAL 3 application in your plant. If, if it's a process plant and you have a SEAL 3, there may be something missing because we should. I, I've been working on this for a long, long, long time and I've seen two applications of SEAL 3 in my life. That's it. I haven't seen more seal threes. So if you have seal three, if you have more than one seal three in a plant, it may be that that something else is missing in the design, or it may be that you're being extremely conservative in the assumptions that you're making when you're calculating your your safety integrity levels. So I would look into it two and three times if if I get a seal three in any in any in any application that is in the process industries. So. You know, and then yeah, it, it's difficult. If you can't achieve SEAL 3 and there is nothing else you can do in your scenario, you should, I mean, SEAL 3 is achievable. So you should operate as you can with the SEAL 2 function until you can replace it for SEAL 3 components and then put up the management system that allows you ensuring that that SEAL 3 is operating as a SEAL 3 because that that will be important if you need a seal three function and you're using a seal to one there is quite a significant risk gap that is not being theoretically covered you could cover that risk gap in real life with other safety measures like mitigation safety measures but you shouldn't operate like that continuously like you shouldn't operate like that indefinitely so i, I would definitely do something but yeah long story short Achieving SEAL 3 with SEAL 2 capable components, not a, not a good idea. Um, let's see. 
I have another one from Madia here. According to Norox 070, whole loop of function for some PSD functions are SIL1 and components need to be capable SIL2. How are we going to decide which components need to be cap capable SIL2? Easy. All of them. Because that's what happens with uh, prescriptive standards like Norox 070. Right, it's telling you that the function needs to be SIL2. So, sorry, SIL1. The whole SIF needs to be SIL1. So the standard it's already telling you, not 070 is already telling you. In order to achieve at least SIL1, we want all of the components to be at least SIL2 capable. So that when you put them together, the function is at least SIL1. So all of the components, all of the components need to be SIL2 capable. That's the easy way to go around it. Um, NOROC 070 for some functions does give you a probability of failure on demand. It tells you like SIL1 with, with less than 0 0.02 per year. Um, I think two, 2 times to minus 2, I think probability of failure on demand, it tells you for SIL1 functions that are prescriptively defined. So if it tells you that all components need, to, if it tells you components need to be SIL2 capable, you need to follow that. You also need to achieve a probability of failure on demand of what? the standard tells you, which I think it's two times two minus two. Um, if you buy components that do that, then you should be SIL1. Uh, sorry, yeah, you should you should achieve the SIL1 requirement that the standard defines. And if you achieve SIL1 in architectural constraints and achieve systematic capability one, then I would say the standard has nothing on you to say you shouldn't do that. So, but long story short, again, I would mm, I would purchase SIL2 capable components and that and then I would be sure my function as a whole is SIL1 or better. Um, let me see more questions. We have a few minutes left. Um, so I have one by Jan. RC levels of instruments and or equipment determined by auditors or solely by their failure. SIL instruments don't have SIL. Again, the SIL capability not determined by auditors, sometimes developed, uh, determined by their own manufacturers. So what the SIL capability of an instrument will, will come, for example, from they do a failure mode and effect analysis and they find the failure rate of this component and it's less than the failure rate defined for or the probability of failure on demand defined for a SIL1 uh, function in, in the standard, right? So that will, in combination with other things, potentially achieve SIL1. So they do a, a, an FME or an FMEA of, of their component, of a transmitter, of a valve, or a hy hydraulic circuit, whatever it is, and um, hydraulic power unit and you define the failure rate. Apart from the failure rate, Jan, they also need to look into systematic failures. So if there's any, for example, if there's any programmable components in that in that instrument, um, they need to check that all the all the software is is achieving the requirements of IC61508 and IC61511 um, in regards to software. They also need to make sure that all the systematic errors are have been looked into as per what the standard requires. So it's not only the failure rate, it's also the systematic capability of the manufacturing process. It's also the management systems that the manufacturing companies is using when they achieve this. Now, the certificate where they put all this information in, not done by auditors either. It's normally done by third parties, like they'll hire functional safety experts, which will go and will look into their procedures, they'll do, help them do the FMEA. And, and that's how you define whether the instrument is still capable or not, right? Hopefully that answers the question. Um, so I have one more here by an anonymous. If a set of instruments shall have a specific seal rate, but one or more of them are very expensive to have that seal rate, what should be done? Nothing. I mean, you have to spend the money. That's it. If you need a seal three, like this ties a little bit to, to what Mashdi asked. If, if you need a seal three, 
and all you can afford are CO2 components, you're going to live with a risk cap. That's it. So if a set of instruments need a specific seal capability, but one of them, or the, of them are, are very expensive, what should be done? Save, save the money so that you eventually can buy them because you need those components to achieve that function. Either that or you very smartly redesign your process, but that's probably going to be more expensive to eliminate some of the hazards. And then if you do eliminate some of the hazards, then the seal requirement for the function will decrease. Remember always that the seal requirement for the function, for the safety instrumented function, is determined by the number of initiating events you have and the likelihood of those initiating events occurring. So if you eliminate the initiating events, the seal requirement decreases. So that's why I said if you identify a seal three, maybe something is missing in the plan. Maybe you need more independent safeguards that are not electric, electronic, programmable electronic devices, or maybe you need to look into the initiating events and you need to remove them. And that's the best way to go about it, because then um, you're not making your process inherently safer, but you are reducing the likelihood of things going wrong. If you simplify your process, for example, in a way that makes it less likely that things will fail, then the seal requirement for your functions will go lower. Um, always think that functional safety is also re it's, it's related to safety overall. So it's also related to uh, inherently safe design. Functional safety, it's, it's one of the tools we have to manage risk, but inherently safe design should trump everything. So always go into your design and check if you can make it inherently safe because then you won't need seal. And the safer you make the design on its own, the lower the seal requirements you're going to have. So normally when you have very high seal requirements in a process plant, it's because something's missing, something, something's not quite right. OK, so this is an interesting one. All of them are interesting one. Great questions. Maybe the last one we have time for, but let's go through it. Uh, Ledum asks, how do I verify the seal capacity rating of a piece of equipment or component that I bought? OK, so difficult because normally you do it with a certificate, right? And and it's a con it's a trust system like many of the things we humans do. It, it's based on trust. You're trusting that the certificates are done by a by a reliable source. You're trusting that the work is properly done, and that's why you normally choose third parties that are reputable because you trust that they are doing what they say they are doing. So how do I verify the sealed capacity? If you don't have a certificate, it's going to be difficult. That's the easy way. The difficult way is you can take the component, you can break it apart to failure mode and effect analysis or uh, to calculate the failure rate or over a long time. If you've used this component over a long, long time, but it needs a million hours of operation or so, you can get significant failure rates that you can then use to derive real life failure rates, which are always better than calculated ones. So that will help you on the failure rate part of it. Then on the systematic one, on the systematic part, you can do what we call proven in use, which again, you have enough hours of operation. You can see that no errors are occurring. So basically you're going to have to derive it from real life data of the component, right? So this is explained in IC61508, how you can make sure that you are achieving the required seal while you know you know during operation if you don't have any other information so the easy way is certificates um the, the very difficult but of course best ways to prove it in real life but then you need a lot of hours of operation of that component um i think that's that's all the time we have now i'm missing a few questions i'm sorry um but time's run out no i do need to go so uh, <laughs> we will take all the questions and we'll probably publish them on our LinkedIn or somewhere else. But if you like the webinar, um, thank you so much for, for coming here. If you liked it, just let us know and then we'll probably make more of this and we'll try to get the questions out there so you can see the answers, all the ones that we had. And um, 
all the ones that we couldn't go through, that we didn't have time to go through. But uh, thank you so much. It's, it's always good to see that some people are interested in functional safety and process safety and safety in general. Thank you so much. It's been very nice. Have a good day. We'll talk to you again at some point. Cheers.